co-edits the journal Forms in Health Economics and Policy and is on the editorial board of the journal Health Economics, widely published in the field. Uh, listen to me because I, I, I just learned, I just learned that uh, Tom's topic is going to be controlling geographic variations in health care, the role of private markets. When I asked Tom if the geographic variations related to national or international ones, he said, well, just national today. But we'll start with the national controlling geographic variations in, uh, in health care, and then we'll, we'll pursue that next year we're going to be touching on global again. So it's a great pleasure. Great pleasure. Welcome, Tom, back to the center. Join us. Thanks for having me. Is the Nick uh, working up there? Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm not, uh, unfortunately, the paper I had on uh, global health is uh, on my computer, but I'm going to be there uh, yet. So hopefully, that I'll be in some future opportunities. I apologize for switching from international to national topics up front, but hopefully, this is something that I can do as well. Uh, it's a paper. That's co authored with a bunch of people. Most of them I've had students here. Uh, some of them are in Boston, and I'm some of them are in South Florida Grand Corporation. Dana Goldman runs the Health Economics Shop at Grand Corporation. And then, uh, Seth B. Seabird, the Federal New Law, who enjoys what it was. So, I'm going to go ahead and by the Dartmouth Atlas. How many people have heard about the Dartmouth Atlas? This is something that people are happy with this. Sort of familiar with at least certain buzzwords. And, and what we look at in this paper is to basically discuss the evidence generated by the Dartmouth Atlas and contrast that really to some other evidence that we have. The evidence of the doctor has that we talked about a, a study at Dartmouth has, that has the entire Medicare data set has shown, and this has really been a big interest into the performance that we just have, that there's big utilization and spending differences across the country, which many people take as kind of inefficient that you know, the part of these that requires the amount of money in Miami they will do, let's say in Minnesota. And this is where the numbers come that you heard. I don't believe them, but you heard them in the press that a third of healthcare spending is wasted, etc. That comes from the Dartmouth Atlas and type of evidence showing uh, massive inequalities in spending, or the difference in spending through controlling for procedures and patients across the US. What this paper takes off is essentially to first note that that's for the Medicare program. And the Medicare program obviously is a public program. And therefore may have uh, uh, less, uh, or different, I should say, incentives uh, than, a, uh, than a public pay, uh, than a private payer involved in providing health care. It's a private insurance company versus a public insurance company. A public insurance company is funded essentially by taxes, whether you view that as mandatory premiums or not, it's you know, a philosophical issue, but it is funded by taxes, we can agree on that. And, and basically, uh, spending occurs at the will of regulations such by CMS, Central Medicare and Medicaid Services, as implementing acts passed by Congress. That's presumably different from a private insurance plan. Private insurance plan uh, basically has to get its money from premium revenue. So the way the private plan operates is it has a bunch of customers, they pay premiums, that has to come to health care, it pays for in terms of delivering care with doctors and hospitals like you. So it can't be that they're spending a lot on health care below premium, that would be a charity organization that have to collect the revenue from premium. More importantly, therefore, they compete on premiums, obviously. Other things constant, you want to cheaper for health care plans. And, and therefore, insurance plans will basically engage in telling doctors what to do more. Because 
they need to limit spending in order to attract customers to lower premiums. That's the name of the game of utilization reviews. All the doctors hate it, uh, but the insurance companies don't love it either. They like the reason they like it is because they can keep their premiums low and actually get more people to buy their health care plan at the beginning of the year. So there's a little bit of conflict with doctors who claim that you know they can't practice good medicine, and that's probably true. The problem is that good medicine many times people can't afford the premium, there's a fight here between resource use at the time of service between the insurance company uh, who needs to keep down premiums and doctors and providers who want to provide great care. <clears throat> that is not true for Medicare. Medicare does not compete on price. Medicare does not compete on premium. They get the premium, they get revenue from taxes. They do not have to be competitive on the premium. They don't have it. You get Medicare when you're about 65, regardless. And you have some supplemental insurance in the private market. You put a co pays But the Medicare expenditures don't have to balance. They have to balance the tax revenues they get from Congress. But they don't have to balance anything directly with the patients that they serve. Someone had a question. <coughs> Uh, another difference, yeah. Um, aren't you also emphasizing the degree to which the public, <clears throat> to which the private payers um, are have this incentive, incentive to limit inefficient care because so many of them are providing care for the employees of large corporations where the large corporation is self-insured and the insurance company is basically just doing an ASO service and earning um, and earning their revenue from the ASO service, not from the premium. Well, it depends on the situation. And it's more than it's more than half of all people that are covered that way. Employee, yeah, well, I'm talking about private insurance companies selling as or a finance by premium. If the employers are self-insured, they still have an administration on, for example, like I'll help get my own. The employer plans are still selling uh, part of their services. The employer at the beginning of the year. University of Chicago buys the healthcare plan services at a price, and that price is determined by uh, resource use. Right. You know, I don't pay for it. University of Chicago pays, but just a group market as opposed to uh, uh, individuals. But the price of the ASO service is only a small part of the price of the overall capital. So the part of it that's there is an incentive to build limited. Put it this way: I'll, I'll be happy to uh, say that the private sector has stronger incentives. And the, that the government limit costs at the price of service. And if you're comfortable with that, we can proceed. Okay. A quick question. You said that, that from the Dartmouth, from many of these data sets, people have concluded that the uh, health care is about, there's about a 30% inefficiency in the U.S. health care, private sector. And I thought that that was really accounted for by the private companies having to and have the administrative costs to carry out utilization review and case management and benefits and analysis and so forth. No, it's, it's, and that was really the, the administrative cost of the private It's actually not as high as the, the for, for example, let's take, let's take, you know, the medical loss ratio has to do with how much premium revenue they have compared to what they pay out and how their services cost to provide them. Okay. If you take profits, for example, in that, it's been estimated by, for example, people who are not very friendly to the industry that profits of $20 billion a year in the insurance industry. It talks a lot to like a lot of money compared to, you know, two and a half a trillion dollars in healthcare spending. That's very small. That's one. So the question is, you know, and I'll get back to this later. What are some of the costs that the private sector are incurring and are there benefits associated with that compared to Another difference between Medicare or Medicaid and private sector insurance is that if you own a private sector company, you can make profit. And that's what makes the world go wrong sometimes. Uh, so, what? Well, it goes around by itself, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, it motivates people, I should say. So uh, a lot of times, uh, people who are doing better things can sell more. And uh, the profit motive is essentially uh, 
ways to stimulate presumably better production, but that's a major difference. There's no residual claimant in the government. Put it differently. There's no one at CMS who benefits if we reduce healthcare variation, inefficient healthcare variation. No one at CMS will go home with a better standard of living if they were to reduce inefficient care. That's a major difference between a private sector company uh, and uh, a publicly run company as well. So there's no, there's a stark difference in incentive. Economists in general, and we particularly believe that the private sector is always out there trying to see how to reduce costs. That's like how they make money, that revenues minus cost plus profit. So therefore, if you're a profit maximizer, you're a cost minimizer. So that, you know, cost inefficiencies in some sense, across regions or within regions, there's money to be made if they're avoided in the private sector. There's not money to avoid. There's no similar incentive in the public sector. That's a major difference, again, between the two. So we would think, therefore, which is true, that private companies are much more engaged in trying to restrict utilization at the time of care. They're much more engaged in trying to monitor hospitals and doctors and weed out and not contract with people who spend a lot of money without corresponding benefits. Presumably, they don't want to minimize cost completely the zero. But if I shut it down, you realize that this is the self-care value. Uh, but inefficient care, they have an enormous incentive to basically try to leave those darker than that for the private cost and that for the better. Again, the government does not have the same incentive. So part of this is also just avoiding fraud. There's been a big discussion recently about the fraud in here in Miami is sort of the world capital of uh, fraudulent care or something. Like that. Empty doctor's office that ordered a lot of durable equipment for them. And the reason this takes place, in my opinion, is because the government is not overseeing utilization. So just a fraud component, even if you believe they're equally good at providing care, I think there's clear evidence that the amount of fraud sometimes estimated to be 50% of Medicare spending. And it seems to be larger because there's no oversight and there's not efficient oversight in the Medicare program of how utilization uh, takes place. So the way we think about this and, and economics is essentially there's a margin of benefit of care or utilization and there's a margin of cost. And remember the, the benefit of providing more care outweighs the margin of cost to go ahead and do it until they equal. So I want to think about utilization review or utilization restrictions if you want. As some attempts by the private sector to try to control the inefficient care, meaning care larger than we normally better with equal amount of cost. If this is free, don't worry about the CS if you don't need it. So what that means is essentially that you kind of get a truncated amount of distribution of care oops, in, in the private sector. So you have some utilization in the public sector over docs and providers, and then you will have the same utilization in the private sector except that you uh, limit through a certain level, U of R, we call it, limit utilization and not to occur beyond that level but, and, and in terms of the inefficient level of, of care. So you have, you know, how much, if this is a number of hospital days distribution, for example, you would have the, the public sector look like this and then you have, would have some cutoff here but below which the private sector doesn't go. And therefore, the mean of the private sector utilization uh, is going to be lower, presumably, than the mean of the public sector utilization. <laughs> 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 There's a bunch of stuff that you totally disagree here. I so, disagree with everything. <laughs> that's why I said you disagree. So basically, uh, if you think of the mean spending in a region being on the x-axis here, and the same mean spending in the private sector as the mean spending of the public sector in the x-axis, the mean spending of the private sector uh, on the y-axis, if they spend equally much, you would be on this 45 degree line. And as 
this would be private patients spending average private patients spending for a given condition. This would be average public spending for a given condition. But what we basically argue in this paper is that the sector impact, that is to say, how much more, how much larger spending is in the, in the public sector than in the private sector, is going to be driven basically by how much waste there is in the public sector. So going back here, if you shift this distribution to the right, you're going to have a larger difference between the private and public sector. So if you go to Miami where there's a bunch of uh, care which is inefficient, including fraud, then you're going to have a larger difference between the private and public sector in Miami than you have, let's say, in Minnesota where we don't have fraud. So basically what, we're gonna, what, we, what, we, what we argue in this paper is therefore that the, the extent of geographical variation in the private sector will be less as a consequence. Because if the government sector provides inefficient care because it's not controlling the utilization at the time of care, then the more it does of that, the larger of the difference between the two. And that's going to lead to a larger variation in public sector care or public sector uh, utilization across the country, then it will lead to a private sector utilization in the country. So we essentially we're arguing here that there's an excess variation in care across the country displayed by the dark atlas. And now we're going to go to the private sector data and for private healthcare plans and see whether the variation in care in the private sector data is lower than we have in many. Just to clarify, the dark atlas is based entirely on Medicare data. On Medicare data. Entirely. That's what people don't realize. The public program that has this inefficient amount of variation. And what we're going to try to show here, and uh, to show quite consistently, is that when private incentives act, we don't have that same amount of variation. Are you going to be accounting for the fact that many insurance companies refuse to cover certain procedures or deny care to individuals with pre cost conditions and so on and so forth? Are you going to be Yeah, I mean, in some sense, that's going to show up. That okay. Any, any utilization denial here uh -huh. shows up as basically not having this tail over here. So the tail would include individuals with difficult or costly conditions. <coughs> well, if you don't pay the premium, you don't get care. So if you have a pre-existing condition, you don't show up in our data set. So, the waste would include individuals who have to... No, 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 that's not the argument. The market, suppose we paid for the premiums for everybody to go to private coverage. Then it would be included in the coverage, but right. we still have utilization but, review. I'm just asking... So we're not arguing comparison. about pre-existing conditions should or should right. not be covered. No, no, no. I just, I just wondered who was included in the privately insured. The people who paid the premiums. Okay, so the people who are not denied coverage after they get sick. Correct. Right. You have to pay a premium to okay. get private coverage. Okay. Um, since you talked about the larger variability of waste, of waste um, how do you determine what is waste? Yeah, that, that was my question. No, I mean, that's basically it. Basically, what we're arguing here is that we're going to observe less variability for, for a given condition. We're going to look at heart disease. Okay. We should put it this way. I, I can't take a statement on a normative statement. I, I can take a positive statement. We're showing less variability for sure in the private sector for the same condition as we do in the public sector. The Miami case is a clear case where fraud is waste. Whether you want to talk about people getting treated more in the public sector, I'm fine with calling it uh, more appropriate and more care compliant. But it is clear that uh, private sector, by having residual claimants, or uh, basically getting profits and also <coughs> competing on price, which the government doesn't do, have strong incentives to engage in the utilization review issues. So the private data set is called the Genix data set. It's a large sample and a great number of records. Uh, and it, include, uh, it includes both medical and pharmacy. And pharmacy is something that we are control group here because we're going to do this before 2006 from Part D of the care for drugs uh, uh, kick in. 
and therefore we're interested in whether uh, these drugs were drug because they're essentially even for Medicare patients, drugs are essentially in the private sector as well, even though people have Medicare coverage for medical uh, for the public, we're going to have a current beneficiary survey of, uh, of Medicare, uh, and which is a survey based data set that links with Medicare uh, claims. So people are not reporting their own expenditures between the year after their claims data for their expenditures. So, one issue with the Dartmouth analysis in general, which uh, we don't think has been uh, thoroughly recognized, is that there's too much aggregation going on in those studies. That is to say, they report by hospital region average utilization or average spending uh, for patients across diseases. Okay. And what we're trying to do here is to focus in on one disease to neutralize the fact that different health of the population distributed across the country would just give a positive correlation between private and public sector care, just driven by the health of the population. And, and in the regions with very sick people who would have very high and public event spending, and regions with very healthy people who would both have low and public and private spending. And the Dr. Atlas announced many times did not do that. They just aggregate across all conditions. Like they say spending for Medicare or enrollee in a certain regional area and, and try to uh, <coughs> basically sometimes try to control for these categories in that, what the distribution of health is in that. Region. But the initial evidence that came out did not do that. That's simply just what's the variance in spending across the country for Medicare and early. And there is, you know, there's many reasons why that should vary. Not only the health of the population, but also the supply conditions. What hospitals and doctors are available in those areas, and if there's limited supply, then prices will be higher in spending. So we try to get away from that by looking at one particular condition of heart disease here. Uh, and uh, and, and, and uh, both the samples, in both the Medicare sample and the private uh, sector sample. And that's identified by ICD-9 codes, which you probably understand a lot better than I do. <coughs> so basically, uh, we estimate a regression, and uh, what we do is uh, predict the notation here. What we do is, is try to do the following. We try to control for people's age, gender, etc., demographics, for individual level, these are individual level data, patient level data. And then we tend to take out, taking out all those demographics, what's the region specific effect in, in the region you're living in? We're going to look at MSAs uh, here, uh, have about 100 of them. So what's the region specific effect we can attribute to a given city, let's say Chicago, controlling for how old the person is, what gender they have, and also controlling for what comorbidities they have. We have a bunch of comorbidities kind of measure what sick the patient is, because that presumably may alter the utilization of gets to make sure that the hospital is working. So the Medicare population is grossly over 65, though, and I would imagine the employer pick persons have to be, on average, under 65. Right, there's a bunch of analysis to yeah. deal with. So basically, we estimate an age effect, yeah. no, we estimate an age effect within the samples uh, that go between, and then we take out that age effect from the region. So and let's say patients are eliminated from both the questions. Yeah, this is just Medicare versus care. I see you've listed income there also, but where are you getting individual level income data for? Certainly for Medicare, and on the private side, it's not usually part of the health record either. Well, it's both in both these surveys. The Medicare beneficiary survey is income data. Uh, the question of expanding on the socioeconomic uh, or income issue, are you able to capture out-of-pocket costs that people are willing or have to expend that could be different? Than yeah, we have a bunch of plan measures in here uh, and for the private sector. And the second is with regard to ICD coding, uh, it's been well shown that that flexes depending upon the incentive of the payment program to which the ICD-9 codes are being submitted so that if Medicare prioritizes certain payments and there's a soft call on how you code it where you have to go get more data to code it and get the money, you will. And if you don't get the money, you don't worry about it and that code drops off. So the same patient with the same condition 
could easily be coded differently between the two programs based on the payment incentive based on ICD time code. Correct. We don't do, we uh, basically our implicit assumption, we can't get data on that, but okay. our implicit assumption is that that goes on like the same between the private sector and the public. So that's No, there's not coding in, in, in DRG code for all the time. Right? So, but the question is, does it occur differentially between the two sectors? My guess would be that it would be that it occurs more in, in Medicare because there's not so much monitoring on what you're doing. But did you think you said the Medicare data it was patient self-reported heart disease as opposed to ICD-9 codes, which are physician assigned? Correct, right, but that's we have the Medicare claims data for the Medicare patient. What about the ICD? In the claims data, we have the codes. So this is insurance claims that we have the codes associated with. So you're verifying it two ways, one of the patients that they have it in Medicare. No, the, the survey is basically for demographic insurance. Right. That survey is linked with the claims that they have. In the Medicare beneficiary survey, you ask a bunch of uh, old person a bunch of questions, and then you also get a Medicare claim. I'm still confused. Okay. Yeah. I hope you'll get to it, talking about the comparability of the two sets for the age and income and so on and so forth. Okay. That's a concern because they're going to be so different as far as age distribution and income distribution. Right, but what we want to do is to say, suppose we hold constant and look at, we'll do some analysis on this uh, later, but suppose we look at a 50 year old in the private data and a 60 year old in the private data. We estimate what is the impact of aging on that claim, on what we're under these months. So we get a, you know, we get a, generally we look at health expenditures as exponential growth with age. So we get, you know, we get curvature estimated with it before 65 by the price. So we can see how aging affects things. It's not dramatic, actually, very little. In terms, I mean, once you get in the hospital, heart disease, you know, first question they know, I mean, it's not aging, it's not necessarily something that we could directly observe in our data being correlated with things. Second, in the, in the Medicare sample, we can do the same thing with the fair thing. So if we estimate that, we have a joint sample of the two. We estimate basically what's the impact of aging on claims in that joint sample. So we're, we're trying to control it. Did you account for race in the demographic? <coughs> I believe, yeah. I believe, uh, good question. I should give you the right answer. I'm not actually sure because I'm not sure that, uh, that, that the really private guys were reported. Right, because it seems like there would be a huge difference between private pay and a Fortune 500 company and Medicare in terms of ethnic. Again, the demographics don't drive much here. We'll get to that. But I mean, the demographics don't drive. Demographics drive over overall healthcare spending, no doubt. But once you have heart disease, are you going to have a different effect of the private and public sector for whites and blacks? The question is, is the, is the interaction effect that you care about? We have a differential effect for whites and blacks uh, of the sector that they're treated in. No doubt that overall claims differ. Oh, that's why we want a condition. On a particular condition, <coughs> you show up in the hospital, and then the question is, does, does these, these covariates matter much? And the answer is it doesn't. Matter. But that condition, overall, it does. Because you know different ethnic groups have different diseases, etc. But here we're talking about particular diseases. That's one of the reasons we wanted to go this way. There were a lot of other things. Okay, so what we're interested there for is this and the sample analog, if you want, of this picture. If we now estimated these regional effects, taking out other things uh, that determines your, your utilization, we're going to now estimate what's the specific component of your, your utilization that's due to the MSA you live in. And then we take a particular point in this figure right here, and we're going to plot what's the public, in the public sector, what is that utilization effect due to the weakening of life. And in the private sector, what is that uh, extra kick of utilization due to the city you live in look like? That's what we're going to try to go over the data. And it looks something like this. So this basically shows the region fixed effects, meaning taking out other covariates of what determines your utilization. This is, shows the distribution of uh, how 
these MSAs drive your hospital days in, here in the public sector and here uh, in the private sector. So again, the point here would be Chicago, let's say. This point would represent Chicago showing, uh, these are D means, so they have mean zero by construction, but this would represent Chicago. How much extra kick do you get compared to the average city by living in Chicago in terms of utilization? If you're in Medicare, that's down here. How much extra kick do you get living in Chicago in the private sector compared to the average city? And that over here, both of them in this case would be below their average. So zero is the average city, and this is how much uh, variation you have from the average city. And what you'll see here is that there's a lot of variation in the public sector, and less corresponding variation here in, in the private sector. What you also will see is that the more uh, utilization there is in the public sector, the larger is the gap between the pub, private sector and the public sector. And that's why we want to interpret this earlier that if you go back to this figure, if you shift this utilization distribution out to the right, if this is the public and we're cutting it off by utilization review and prior authorization, etc., in the private sector, then you will have a larger gap. The more this thing shifts to the right, the larger the gap will be between the public sector and the private sector. And that's this, this is a unit slope line here telling you that for low expenditure cities or low utilization cities, you don't have much of a difference between the two. But for high Medicare utilization cities, I presume this over here is my hand or something, uh, you have big differences, and you have big differences between uh, the private and public sector. This shows for outpatient visit, again for heart disease. Exactly. That Sort of vertical line, giving it a scale. That's actually supposed to be the 45 degree line, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, we started at the lowest city. We yeah, started, no, I mean, zero is a zero. unit slope line. It's a unit slope line. Yeah. It doesn't have to start at zero. But it, it, it's not 45 degrees because you have different scales. Yeah. Right, right. But it's fairly equal. That's the, the, we start at the lowest and then we draw an equal utilization line out. Now, Here's the same uh, pattern across <coughs> cities for uh, uh, outpatient visits. And here you actually have a negative relationship uh, between the two. But again, in terms of variation, you have a lot more variation here on this dimension than you have on this dimension. Probably attributable to this wider gap and the further out Again, I would assume this is my hand here. Further out, you go in public utilization. This is just the variant. This is just the estimated distributions in the two sectors. For the private sector, for hospitalization, you have a sort of a big spike, the lower variance in this distribution. This again is a, the regional effects taking out other areas of utilization, and deviating them so that the average city has a zero effect. Here's the distribution on the private, and then we sort of have a fatter, higher distribution uh, uh, of the public in terms of hospital days. For outpatient visits, you have kind of, just looking at the parameter price, it doesn't look so funny, uh, but you have kind of, again, a big spike private utilization around the knee, and then you have the public kind of being fatter scale. So if you compute variances for these things, presumably you have higher variances. If they start to move to the new healthcare system, I assume that's going to create more of a public and less of a private working sector. Would you predict that this would be yeah, that is in slide 14? <coughs> okay, but I mean, the it has to do with Part C versus Part A. Yeah, I mean, so you would expect to see very dramatic increases in variance, which means that all the cost control estimates that they're projecting have to be more. We tend to come to the same conclusion. Do okay. you know if the private plans provide a home visit? Because if they did, uh, there would be no comparison that would be fair with utilization costs. We have spending data. We, have, we get the spending, so that would show up in spending, but not necessarily in these utilization metrics. But if that if that structure of healthcare was in fact way more efficient, it would be because one was privatized and one was not. It would simply be that the 
healthcare system doesn't offer quality support. Right. And that means the Medicare system has to rely on those two modes of intervention with the patient that would be disadvantaged in comparison simply because it has a different right. option. That's, that's a, a good point. We can actually probably look into that in terms of uh, uh, are there any cardiac cardiologists in the audience? <laughs> <laughs> have a good heart. <laughs> yeah, so the question is essentially whether if you have private sectors allowing home care as a cheaper substitution for, for inpatient care or outpatient care. you more uh, if you can reduce the number of hospital things. That was the big incentive. They're incenting people home after home heart surgery after three days. But they go either to a step down unit outside the hospital or to home health care. But that doesn't really affect your uh, cost. It does for hospital days. Yeah, that's hospital days. But I'm talking about yeah. budgetary items. Yeah. It's a big, uh, it's a big savings. Well, they want to avoid the high cost. So they get that out of the high cost. Yeah, but see, for the hospital, the, the, the cost is great. First day is uh, the highest. After that, it tails way off until the sixth day, you're paying a hotel uh, rate, right? So uh, the hospital is incentivized to keep them there because they're going to get their cost back. And the insurance companies are incentivized to get them off because they're still paying a high daily uh, cost rate. That's the Medicare, that's you can't send them home. You can't, Medicare patients will stay longer because you can't get home infusions. You can't get additional equipment. You know, I'm still concerned about how people got into these data sets. I mean, there's an old public health concept called the healthy worker effect. Employed and employed population is going to be by nature, you know, much healthier. That's why we control for having heart disease. So right, right, but heart disease in a healthy 50 year old, otherwise healthy 50 year old is very different than heart disease in a 75 or 80 year old even controlled for age, who's from a lower SES, let's say it has had health problems. I'll tell you, I'll tell you about the analysis which we did, which basically replicated this by just looking in the Ingenix private data when people turn 65. Okay. So now we have a poor population. But only 65 and older. Over 65. So now they have some of them have Medicare, some of them have private charges attached to Medicare. Mm -hmm. But you have the same working population in the private data, we you just have that they're now eligible for Medicare. And do you have the working Medicare, did you, look at the, did you look at the working Medicare population? Could you do that? Well, it's a little bit different because if you're working, uh, you know, your private pay is the first payer. If you retire, your private pay, but the first pay is Medicare. So there are, but there, there have to be plenty of working people in the Medicare. Right, pay, no, right? what I'm trying to tell you is that when we did this right. analysis, okay. this replicated. Okay. Uh, I, I, we did some other stuff. Well, I'm going to talk about it later. Looking at this variance, one of the genuine difficulties that people have with the Lindbergh data is nobody can explain why it persists as long as it does once it's public knowledge. So the question I'm asking around that is if you took their data and divided it between private and public achievement centers, right? Or would you find the level of variance? Whatever is being by, by patient type treatment. They don't do that. They kind of do it by hospital, by leaders, and so forth. They have only Medicare data. They have only Medicare data? Yeah, that's why I started. Oh, oh they, they don't have any non-Medicare data? No, right. That's the whole point. Well, wait, wait, wait. well then, then the studies don't tell you anything. <laughs> 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 because essentially what they do tell you is this. Essentially, in the private set, the competitive entity tends to converge towards single prices and uniform standards. Is that another one of your slides? Yeah. And whereas the public sector, which is only a single monopoly provider, local variations are not going to be corrected by the Did that be, So that becomes the explanation for the Weinberg study. What will happen? Because, because the current, the data book thing that you're talking about is only Medicare data. Weinberg did lots of studies prior to that being his focus, where he used <clears throat> data on a hospital basis where the data came from all patients, not just Medicare. And all his original work that I started reading as early as about 1980, you know, the studies in Maine, um, were not based on any claims data at all. They were based on hospital regional data. Yeah, you get a bunch of mixed locations. Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. And the, way, the reason he went on to the Medicare stuff 
is that he found that that was the easy way to basically see if there was a national image of the same sort of thing that he was finding in small local communities in Maine. Yeah, but it's a national image of a, of a company that paid price for having a fishing. Well, I believe he will, he will tell you that his impression is that what he was finding in Maine, based on all patients, was not all that terribly different in scope than what he was finding well, here. I would guess I would disagree with you. Well, well, but I mean, I don't, I mean, it would be interesting to have him in the room. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is your density measure, by the way? Is it days per thousand and visits per thousand, or what? Or what's it's possible the days per episode of care. Per episode of care. <clears throat> so, so uh, yeah, I think people uh, in this inefficiency debate that we're wasting so much healthcare dollar uh, is the implicit assumption that we're looking at public, public insurance data. I think that's very important. Right. Here is for prescription drugs. Here we look at uh, prescription both spending and prescriptions. Uh, and here, we don't find any difference. What? One. And if you came in earlier, <laughs> if you came in earlier, I talked about prescription as our control group because this was before Part B, so prescription are provided in the private sector for Medicare beneficiaries provided in the private sector for private people. Yes, separate as it also in Medicare. Correct, we don't have any tools. So the Medicare population also doesn't have Medicaid? Because many of no our dual. Medicare patients are both, and they could have got their prescriptions for Medicaid. There's no dual. So uh, basically, this is uh, pre-2006. And, and these guys, essentially, again, this is a variation across cities of these regional effects. And the average city is zero. And you see that these regional effects are distributed uh, pretty close in the tribe and public sector. There's a little bit of difference, there's no talk about this. This is an interesting thing, I think you don't need a slide to talk about the target, so we will look at the bar down in the numbers. What we did also was to say, there's all this talk about regional variation in the health economics community. How much does do, do these regional effects that I talked about explain what share of the overall variance across U.S. patients is attributable to the regions themselves as opposed to you know, comorbidities, age, gender, whatever, other things that are determined on the hospital that you see. So what is, what, what share of variance across the U.S. population in, in, in treatment outcome is attributable to, those, to these regional differences in patient level data? And the answer is about one or two percent. Very small. I mean, both for public and private, regional differences are very, very small. have very little uh, sort of explanatory power, if you want, in explaining the overall variation. That doesn't mean that lowering medications <coughs> could be saving a lot of money. It can be saving a lot of money. But it also suggests that there are other factors that could even save more money than regional differences. There are other factors that are more important to variations than the city you live in in our case. So, so why do we do expect there to be giant regional differences? Because of different uh, private, public, because of, well, why would you expect there to be large regional differences? Well, there aren't. Well, all right. I mean, they don't know why I said that. Why, I why say, do you want to expect there, any there are, different? No, there are different, they could be different. One why? is, you know, supply conditions. If you're in a rural area, you have different types of doctors or hospitals, there might be more market power. I thought you were talking about MSA. Doctors. I thought you were talking about MSA. Correct. Mm -hmm. right. okay. Even across even across cities, there could be different supply condition that makes the you know, cost of living differs dramatically living. across okay. cities, for example. Okay. And you have supply difference and actually people have tried to analyze it from that perspective. So Tom, what do you look when you say there were no regional differences? Did this relates to your question? No, you what, get a, you get well, what, what are you looking at? You're looking at age, gender, uh, income, um, income uh, number of physicians for those, population. Okay, those, those may generate differences. What we're trying to do in this in, in the previous discussion when we decompose the variance. No, all I'm asking is what when you when you break the <coughs> 
that there are no regional differences. I just want to know what factors we're taking into account. I'm not saying there's no regional differences. Oh, you're not. Okay. That's a different idea than saying average spending, let's say average spending in, in uh, Miami could be much higher than average spending in Minnesota. Regional difference or different statistically significant by a huge amount or by a small amount, but they're significant. That doesn't mean that your location explains a large share of the variation in patients, because you could have a huge variance of outcomes in Miami and a huge variance of outcomes in Minnesota, driven by comorbidities, income, whatever. So in terms of the overall variation, how much it's explained by living in Miami versus Minnesota, very little, less than 2%. So it's relative to other factors that drive variation. You have that your location only explains 2%. That doesn't mean that location doesn't have a strong impact on your utilization. Yeah, no, this is not. If I just make a comment because I think it's clear, for example, that the, uh, kid, the, um, the experience in La Jolla, if you're familiar with that, Scripps is the only cardiac surgery in La Jolla. They get a huge number of cardiac surgery patients, and uh, the Dartmouth guys were all over, wrote a blistering report. Then it turned out, unbeknownst to them, they had a contract with Kaiser who sent their patients down to La Jolla for their cardiac surgery. So that was huh? Out of region. You know, made it look like the guys at Ohio were bringing them in off the street. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they just about ruined them until they finally got that sorted out. Well, this is per capita spending. So this has nothing to do with aggregates so far. This is per capita, per patient. So if you bring in a thousand. It's the regional that I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, no, no. In the regional data, that will show up, obviously. In the regional data, that may, uh, may show up if you just average them across the Medicare patients. No, sure. but what he's saying is it's exactly the opposite is that if you're doing this, you have to basically handle explicitly treatment in one location and you live in another. And essentially what goes on in this healthcare market is as you go up the gradient to primary, to secondary, and tertiary care, the average distance that people are willing to travel to treatment is very dramatic. I don't know what fraction of our <laughs> treatment is. A lot of them are acute, right? We have heart attacks. Yeah, we do, but we've got a lot of chronic conditions that go like right this. A lot of, for example, people taking um, surgery for prostates and so forth. You know, where you go and what you do, they go a long way from home. Um, and you have, so we're just doing hospital data. It may well be that the areas which have the highest utilization rates may be the most efficient because what they're doing is they're tracking out of patient right. yeah. So scripts, which should be at the top of the pops, is put at the bottom of the pops. Because you know, one of the things that's tracking when we listen to the Lenberg people, they have no discussion of the centers of dynamics in their model. They just sort of inner data coming out. Well, the, the biggest issue is the aggregation issue. They don't know what's going on behind the aggregation. And this would show up as higher for spending for Medicare beneficiary in uh, La Jolla. And, and as opposed to this is conditioning. It depends on where you book on, the expense. What? It depends on where you book the expense. If you book it through the hospital, it's going to look like the utilization. And in one area, if you book it by the patient, then it affects you that they have a much more accurate reading. Both problems with aggregate data, I guess. Okay. But this is, this I would want to, I think it's more useful to basically focus in on a given condition. That's why we're doing that. And, and then we do it on a per patient level. Let me talk a little bit about stuff that's not in the slides that people haven't uh, correctly sort of talked uh, <coughs> about. One is the effect of aging. So what we did, in, for example, in the private data, uh, we replicated something like this by looking at, suppose we look at uh, 55 to 60 year olds in the private data only. And then we look for, uh, for 60 to 64 year olds so we chop up the aging in the private data to look at what's the impact on on there we go that's the impact of uh, 55 to 59 to 60 to 64 and then you see a sort of a much stronger correlation between that aging itself within the private sample uh, basically have that being correlated within the private sample. So now we're just taking a younger group in the private sample, comparing with the older group, and it kind of looks like they're much closer to the uh, 45 degree line. 
Another sort of control we did was to let, like I said, the private sample age in, into age 65. There's a bunch of 65 year olds about in the private sample, but they're still uh, having uh, private insurance coupled with their Medicare. So if you, when you're above 65, roughly on average across all ages, 50% of your expenditures are covered by Medicare. Roughly about 20% are covered by uh, uh, primary coverage, and then you have some Medicare and a uh, lot of talking in the rest. But if it, you know, you go from zero to 50% roughly, a little less, because the older you get, the more likely Medicare is to be your primary pay. So we did that analysis. We basically said, let's compare um, uh, the people in the, in the private sample who are ineligible for Medicare, below 65, people who are eligible for Medicare above 65, even though they don't have a 100% of the care provided by Medicare. And then we get the same kind of graph. We get this larger variation in the 65 plus population across regions than we get in the below 65 uh, uh, population in the regions. What's the mean age between the two databases? I think it's in the early 50s and then it's Seventy or something, but age we're taking out. Remember that? No, I know how you're trying to take that, but it's interesting to compare 55 to 59 and 60 to 64. But you're talking about a 20 year spread at first. That's, what, that's why we're doing this. That's why they're doing the narrow. Yeah. So so now we're so now we're looking at in this larger uh, private data set. When we look at plus 65, we're going to look at 65 to 69. Okay. Compare that to 60 to 64. At maximum, a 10 year span, you're going from a 60 to 7 year old. Right. Yeah, how you're about to show No, I don't have it here. So. <laughs> I'm, telling, I'm telling you what we'll, what we'll come up with. It's the same say. kind of argument, greater variation. Yeah, exactly. You get greater variation in the 65 to 69 year olds in the data compared to the 60 to 64 year olds. But, but you need to point out, even in this private sample right here, a 60 to 64 year old with heart disease who remains employed and able to stay in this data set is going to be healthier yes. than in an overall sense and so may have uh, yeah, fewer hospital be, days than, than other ones. So, 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 these are not necessarily important. So you can have private health insurance without being important. These, these, these are private health insurance. This is Fortune 500, yeah. Fortune yeah, 500. Yeah, but you can be retired. Retired, you can be retired for it. And it's also your your condition of not getting that hospital. I mean, my understanding is that question is that it may well be it's a healthier population, at which point you have fewer admits, but you're only comparing the admits, not the background problems. So the all this stuff just drops out. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, you have a healthier population, a few people going to the hospital for whatever condition it is. When I do what? And when you do these comparisons, you're, you're basically doing a conditional probability on getting into the hospital. So the background probabilities of getting sick don't matter. Isn't that right? Well, I mean, the, no, no. we're conditioning on having, it's not, again, we're not aggregating across the disease. It's just a, we're conditioning on having a disease. Yeah. So that, in, in fact, one population is healthier than another. You have 100,000 in each population. You'll get 2,000 in this in one case and 1,500 in the other. And what you then do is study the variation between those two populations yeah. rather than the four to three ratio. Right. Okay, and that's the answer to the question. And you guys know drop out these people that use their insurance? Not business. But, but because, I mean, one of, one of the issues here that is actually biased against us is that we're comparing the Medicare population, which we're comparing against the private population, that's a mixed private and Medicare population. So we're comparing pure, we're comparing right. pure private against a mixed private and public and still, and still get regional difference, if you, which we will be doing if you, comp if you compute a pure public care and someone who never had private care. Right. And then compare that with a pure, uh, pure public care with a pure private. Presumably, uh, these, these effects are important. Because they had medical care until they're 65. That's right. What? Because they haven't had medical care until they get to be Medicare. No, that's no, 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 They have no insurance. No, 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 no. I mean, Medicare, private companies cannot, can let's say, drop coverage once they get into Medicare. Yeah, private companies can also drop coverage. Again, it would show up in 
and we're arguing that they should be higher in the Medicare sector in order to prevent fraud. But fraud is one issue, but also, I mean, it's easy to get away with high spending in the Medicare system. Um, not per unit, I mean, the prices are lower, but not per unit. In terms of how you're monitored in the Medicare system. Right, so yeah, you, but you but just made be. the Medicare system equivalent to the private sector by increasing utilization. Right. But that would increase administrative costs. Yeah, yeah. Somewhat, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, yeah. It's, it's yeah. Yeah. there already is some extent, to some extent. Medicare was a model of utilization review, and they, yeah. they created there, there are people doing utilization review for Medicare. But not to the extent of the public. Also, the other thing is, because the Medicare is able to keep some of its expenses all budget for government agencies. Um, There's other reasons why the necessary costs yeah. are different. For example, taxes are paid for the government. Well, 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 also the incentive to, to have the